Hello Sigmas! Today we are going to discuss the findings of one of the most famous mathematician and astronomer of his time, Johannes Kepler. And as we all know, these findings are nothing else but the most famous Kepler's laws. Kepler had stated three laws, out of which in this video we are going to discuss the first two only. Kepler's first law states that planets don't move around the sun in circular orbits, but instead they move around the sun in elliptical orbits. That is, if this is our sun, let me draw the sun over here, right? If this yellow circle is our sun, the powerhouse of this solar system, then a planet like the Earth will move around the sun in a kind of this elliptical orbit. Let us say this green circle over here is our Earth, the green planet. Now, one of the facts that you need to know is that gravitational force which acts between the Sun and the Earth is actually a central force. That is, it is always directed towards the Sun. The gravitational force that the Earth will experience, it will always be directed towards the Sun at each point in the orbit. something like that. And that would mean that the gravitational force is of the form, if f of g is the gravitational force, it will have the form f of r, where r is the distance uh, of the Earth from the Sun at each point in the orbit, times r cap, right? This direction is nothing but the r cap direction. In a cylindrical polar coordinates. We have assumed here that we are working in cylindrical polar coordinates and R cap is just the radial vector in the cylindrical polar coordinates which is always directed towards the origin which in our case is the sun. We are assuming the sun to be at the origin or the foci of this elliptical orbit and the gravitational force will always be in the radial direction that is it will be in the R cap direction as we have already discussed in a video on polar coordinates. We'll be using polar coordinates very extensively in this video. So if you have not checked out the previous one, the video on polar coordinates, do check it out for sure. Now, Kepler's first law is something that we are going to prove during our discussion of the central force motion. I'm going to launch a complete series of videos just on central force motion. But in this video, we'll not be discussing the formal proof to the first law. Instead, we'll be discussing the formal proof to the second law because we use the idea of angular momentum that we learned in a previous video to prove Kepler's second law. So if you have not checked out my video on angular momentum, do check it out because otherwise there's no point in watching this video as it is going to be completely based upon the previous video on angular momentum. So what the Kepler's second law, we are going to discuss now the Kepler's second law. The Kepler's second law states that if we have a line joining the sun and the earth, right? This is white line joins the sun, which is at the origin, right? The center of the sun, which is at the origin to the earth, right? Let us say the earth was over here at some point of time. And then later the earth, since it is moving in that orbit, it moves to some other point in that orbit. Let's say it moved to over here. And uh, again, we draw the line that uh, joins uh, both the earth and the sun and we can see that it has covered this area and let us say in about a month right in about one month it has covered that much area right let us call this a1 and now again in the next month what or a few months later if let's say the earth is over here and then again in over a month it moves to some other point over here then the line joining the earth of, to the sun right this is the line that joins the earth to the sun it again has covered some area a2 
And what Kepler's second law tells us is that A1 is going to be equal to A2, where this time is again a month. So basically, in equal interval of time, the line joining the sun to the earth covers equal areas or the aerial velocity of earth is constant. So dA1 upon dt is equal to dA2 upon dt. That is in equal interval of time, the planet covers equal areas. Now, before we formally prove what the second uh, Kepler's law is, right, that is a uh, the aerial velocity is constant. Before we formally prove that, first we are going to look into a very, very interesting property about central forces. It is, what is the torque on the planet due to the force that the sun exerts on it, which is the gravitational force? What is the torque on any object under a central force? What is the torque due to the central force? So the torque due to a central force will be given by R cross F right, where F is the central force. So that is nothing but R cross F of R, as I told you, central forces are of this type, F of R, R cap. Now, what is the cross product of R with R cap? They are both in the same direction. That means sine theta is zero, and hence we get the cross product to be equal to zero. What does that mean? That means that the angular momentum of the planet is a constant because torque is nothing but as we have already seen in our previous video torque is nothing but the rate of change of angular momentum now this i have not proved in my video but instead one of my shots so do check out my shots too so since the dl upon dt is zero l is equal to constant this is one of the most important results about central force motion that a body undergoing central force motion the angular momentum of that body is always going to be constant. And if the angular momentum is constant, that means this planet is going to move in this same plane, right? This orbit has some plane and it is always going to move in the same plane. It is not going to change the plane because if it changes the plane, then automatically the angular momentum vector direction is going to change. But we have just proved here that angular momentum direction as well as magnitude remains constant and hence the planet is going to move in the same plane which is the plane of this orbit okay so now since we have proved this very important property about the central force motion let us now begin the main content that is let us prove kepler's second law to do that, what we are going to do is we are going to consider a very small section of this orbit. For example, since here it has covered a month, let us consider the amount of uh, the portion of this orbit that it covers in, let's say, about uh, a very small time compared to a month, which is, let's say, a second, right? A very, very small time compared to a month, a second, right? In a second, the orbit is going to look something like this now since it is an elliptical orbit the radius is not constant as it has uh, moved about uh, that portion so let us say initially its radius was r r of t at time t and then later its radius becomes r of t plus delta t and it covers let's say a very very small angle as i told you it has just moved for a second so in a second it has obviously covered a very very small angle and let us call that angle delta theta now you can see that for very very small angles as you can also see from this orbit picture for very very small angles this thing is not an arc but it is actually a triangle right for very, very small sections, for very, very small times and very, very small angles, this delta theta, when it is very, very small, you can see that this, this thing is approximately flat, right? It's approximately flat and that would mean that it forms a triangle. Let us say that at time t plus delta t, that is r of t plus delta t is equal to r plus delta r. How do we get this? Let us draw this uh, triangle, right? You can see that if I draw that triangle, you would get something like this. Over here, you can see that 
if this is the uh, right this is delta theta and this is r and this distance this whole distance is r plus delta r then this small section over here right this small section is nothing but delta r right this small section over here is delta r because up to over here it's just r so this uh, extra section over here is going to be delta r the r plus delta r minus r which is delta r so now what is going to be the area of this small triangle the area of this small triangle if i call it delta a it is obviously going to be equal to half into base into height so we just get half base into height next we substitute for the base what is the base what is the base uh, of this triangle we all know that the base of this triangle is nothing but r into delta theta because it has covered a very very small angle delta theta so we can just assume that the radius remains constant as it moves from over here to over here and hence the distance would just be r into delta theta so the base is equal to r delta theta what is the height the height is this r plus delta r so we get r plus delta r right that is the height of the triangle it is going to be approximately this because we have made a lot of approximations but it will turn out to be a really good approximation because we are working with very very small angles that is the planet has moved for only about a second right it it takes 360 days to move around the sun in an elliptical orbit but here we have considered only a second so this is a fairly good approximation so this is going to be equal to half r square delta theta plus half r delta r delta theta now we all know the definition of derivatives right what how do you define da upon dt da upon dt is just going to be equal to limit delta t tends to zero of delta a upon delta t this is how we define derivatives in mathematics so what do we get we get a half limit delta t tends to zero we have an r square and we get delta theta upon delta t we just divide by delta t in this equation if i call it equation number one over here if we divide the equation number one by delta t then we get this r square delta theta upon delta t plus r delta r delta t delta r delta theta divided by delta t okay now as i've told you delta r is a very very small number and so is delta theta so if we multiply two very very small numbers we get a really really small number which is very very small compared to this term and hence what we are going to do here is we are going to neglect the second term because it's really really small so it doesn't really matter if we have it or not so what are we going to get we are going to get over here this is going to be equal to half r square limit delta t tends to zero delta theta upon delta t now what is this this is nothing but the definition of derivatives again as we have over here this is again the definition of derivative but this time it is half r square d theta upon dt this is equal to half r square theta dot now what we can do here is we can divide and multiply by the mass of the planet then what do we get we get m r square theta dot divided by 2m what is m r square theta dot look at it carefully it is nothing but the moment of inertia of the body times the angular velocity so it is nothing but the angular momentum divided by 2m so here mass is a constant but wait we just proved that angular momentum is also a constant in a central force motion and hence this whole term is a constant so this is equal to a constant which is the aerial velocity of the planet and this is exactly what kepler's second law tells us that the aerial velocity of the planet is constant so that was all about this video if you enjoyed this video then do not forget to like and subscribe to my channel if you have any doubts you can leave them in the comments see you next time thanks for watching